Hi, everyone, and welcome today to today's small business update. I'm Jeanette Mulvey, the editor in chief for Co. Today, we're here to discuss several changes the Biden administration has made to its COVID related programs that could impact your business. These include expanding a tax credit that makes it easier for employees and their families to be vaccinated and a streamlining of the PPP loan forgiveness process. We'll discuss these and other COVID relief updates with Tom West from the U.S. Treasury Department, and then the Chamber's own Neil Bradley will join us to break down what this means for your business. Now, later, I'll take your questions for Neil, which you can type into the space on the right side of your screen at any time. We do get a lot of questions, and we will prioritize the most popular ones, but they are being read on the back end, and if yours says pending, uh, don't worry, we are looking at them. With that, I would like to welcome Tom West, the U.S. Treasury Department's Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Office of Tax Policy, to discuss the expanded vaccine tax credit. Tom, thanks so much for being here today. Oh, thank you for having me. This is a, a great audience and a really important and timely topic. So yeah. thanks for the invitation. Thank you. Let's uh, just let's start to talk about there's a small business tax credit previously that allowed employers to get a tax credit for paying employees who were going to get vaccinated and who may need time to recover. That has been expanded to include family members as well. So can you just explain to us about the old program and this addition, and then we can talk a little bit more about why the administration decided to do this. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm happy to. So this credit um, goes back to the CARES Act, in fact, in March of 2020, and even before that, um, as uh, as the COVID crisis was hitting, uh, Congress passed this rule that said you can get this paid leave credit for time uh, that you give your employees off to take care of COVID-related issues, essentially, or if they were caregiving for others who were experiencing COVID-related issues. Uh, that was back in 2020. As you noted, the American Rescue Plan in March of this year expanded and extended this paid leave credit. And so let me talk about that program in particular. Um, the, under the American Rescue Plan, the expanded paid leave credit is available for small employers. And when I say small employers, that generally means employers with 500 or fewer employees. And that can be um, tax exempt entities as well. It doesn't just have to be for-profit businesses. But um, those smaller and medium-sized businesses are eligible for this tax credit for time that they give employees to um, <clears throat> recover from COVID. Let's say somebody had COVID, you know, if you give someone time off to recover from COVID, if someone is isolating or quarantining because of a COVID exposure, if someone is taking care of a family member um, or a child who's school or daycare center was closed down because of a COVID exposure there and COVID protocols. All of those are, um, if an employer gives time off for an employee dealing with any of those situations under the American Rescue Plan, then the employer can get tax credits for the, the salary that they pay the, for the paid time off. Um, as you noted, the American Rescue Plan in particular extended this um, paid leave to people who, uh, time employers who give time off to employees who are going to get vaccinated or who get vaccinated and have some after effects and they're recovering from that. So those are both, those were both critical areas. Um, in March and April of this year, as the administration was really pushing for vaccinations, that was really critical that we um, kind of give employers the incentive to give their employees time, paid time off. Okay. So what does the credit mean? Well, the credit means that for up to 80 hours of time that you give an employee off, if the employee is sick or getting vaccinated, the employer can recover dollar for dollar up to $500 per day, the wages that they, they pay that employee to give them time, to give them time off. So that's up to $5,000 that an employer can get in tax credits for giving their employee time off for, for one of those specified reasons. In addition, if you give time off to an employee who is providing caregiving services to you know, a family member, then 
you can get up to two thirds of the salary that you pay that employee up to $200 per day, up to $12,000, you can get tax credits for that amount. So those are really significant dollar figures we're talking about, right? And this is all about incentivizing employers to give time off to help their employees handle the COVID situation. And also, you know, then presumably those employers are also bent benefiting because either their employees are, aren't coming in and aren't infecting other people, or their employees are getting vaccinated and a vaccinated workforce is a safer workforce. So please go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was just going to clarify a couple of points before you go on. Mm -hmm. um, that fi up to $5,000 and up to $12,000 is um, per employee, correct? That is per employee, yes. And um, when you were saying that they could be, re employers could be reimbursed for the costs of employees who are taking time off to care for family members, in this instance, we're talking specifically about caring for family members who they are taking to be vaccinated or are suffering from side effects post-vaccination is specifically what we're talking about here. Is that correct? That That is correct. So all of these um, reasons for giving paid leave are associated with COVID under the American Rescue Plan. The expanded program that we're talking about or the expansion that the administration put out last week was to cover, as you, as you said, if you are taking a family member, a child, somebody else who lives in your household to get a vaccination, that is now a category for which an employer can give you paid time off and get a tax credit. Got it. So I think you are going to tell us next why the administration did this and why you think it's important. So I would like to let you um, finish that thought. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what we have seen over the last few months is that in places where there are significant, you know, a significant percentage of individuals are vaccinated, those places are having, you know, many fewer infections, certainly many fewer hospitalizations and many fewer deaths. And that is critical. Um, we've done a great job in many parts of this country so far, getting people vaccinated, hitting our vaccination goals. But we've all seen that, you know, especially with the Delta variant, there is uh, still some work to be done. And in particular, when we have talked to individuals who are open to getting vaccinated, one of the reasons they cite for not doing so or being hesitant to do so is they, they can't afford to take time off from work and they're worried about taking time off from work. And so, you know, working with employers and encouraging employers to give time off and then the federal government is going to give those employers tax credits for the paid leave that they give to those individuals. We feel like that's a win-win situation. And, you know, we all know that, you know, the, the, fe the federal government can do, you know, a certain amount here, but you're talking about employers. You're not just talking about employers. When you're talking about small businesses, you are talking about the people who are in the communities. The business owners on this call are the kinds of people who are kind of the trusted members of the community. And so, it's really about kind of partnering with them and allow giving them the tools to give their employees kind of the time to, to get the, the vaccination and, and hopefully get us over this, this last hump. Yeah. So this actually takes me right into my next question, which is we've seen a lot of businesses, mostly larger businesses, mandate vaccines for employees. What is the administration's position on businesses, private businesses of any size, mandating vaccines, or what is your, what do you think the business's role is in getting employees vaccinated? Is it encouraging it? Is it mandating it? I, I just, what is your advice for small business owners who don't really know how far to, and how much to insist that their employees get vaccinated or if they should just encourage it? Yeah. Um, listen, that is a great question and it's a tough question. And it's also one that, you know, as a tax guy, it's a little bit outside of my lane. I know I've been spending a lot of time over the last few months working with my colleagues from across the administration where we've had a whole of government approach to this. Um, what I can tell you is that there are lots of small employers who have said we would, who have said to us in the administration, we want tools to help our employees get vaccinated. We think it is a win-win for, you know, not only for our workspaces to be 
um, safer, but also for our customers to be more comfortable. Um, you know, I think encouraging vaccinations is, uh, again, this, this community, this, this small business owner community is one that is a backbone of our economy, a backbone of our cities and towns. And so hopefully giving them the incentives to allow their employees to take some time to get vaccinated or to take their family members to get vaccinated, right? Because it's not just, if your employees are vaccinated, that's great. But if the employees you know, are risking exposure at home because they can't take time to get their kids or their mother or their father vaccinated, then, you know, that's what we're trying to do with this last kind of uh, expansion of the program. Great, thank you. With this last question, I'm gonna take you straight back into the treasury lane. So sorry, we took that little detour. No. Um, no <laughs> uh, so PPP loans, which used to be what we talked about every single day, all day, are mm -hmm. closed. So you can no longer apply for one, but um, I just wonder if you could talk a little bit about other either funding opportunities or tax um, programs that small businesses can be relying on right now as they're still struggling to make it through uh, COVID? Sure. Um, there, there are a handful of tools that I think are still out there for small businesses. You know, we didn't spend a lot of time um, at the beginning of this talking about how someone actually takes and applies for the paid leave credit that, that I was touching on the five up to five thousand dollars per employee or up to twelve thousand dollars for for caregiving. But that's actually a credit against your payroll tax as a business. And so when you file on a quarterly basis, your form 941, you would apply and you would offset or hold back your normal payroll um, payroll withholding, and you would keep that. And to the extent that you had even more credit than, than you were paying in, you could actually apply and get a refund. And the reason I say all that is because that that is you know cash flow in the small business's pocket. And the same thing is still available for the time being under the employee retention credit. I know you all have talked about that um, through the chamber, and I know you're going to talk about that a little bit later. But the reason I mention that is because, like like you, I know a lot of small businesses were focused on PPP for a long time when that came out, and when the Paycheck Protection Program was first enacted, you couldn't a business couldn't take both a PPP loan and an employee retention credit, and so. When people were being forced to choose one or the other, most small businesses took advantage of the PPP loan, right? But now, uh, retroactively, you're able to go back and also claim an employee retention credit. So what we've seen is a lot of businesses who you know, were operating um, in 2020 and the beginning of 2021 and would have been eligible for employee retention credits, just they didn't think they were eligible because of the PPP loan. You can go back and amend your filings, your Form 941 filings, and kind of claim those credits. So that's one thing you could do. Um, there's also um, what we've seen and heard in working with state and local governments, right? Because this response to COVID is, again, such such a widespread thing. Lots of state and local governments are trying to help small businesses as well. And there's a lot of, you know, small business money available on the local level in the form of grants and other, other assistance from states and localities. Um, after the uh, um, American Rescue Plan, there was a huge state and local um, state and local funding uh, where the Treasury Department pushed hundreds of billions of dollars out to state and local governments. And a lot of those state and local governments I know are using those funds in kind of novel and interesting ways to try and support small businesses. Now I know small businesses have enough you know, that they're struggling with right now that, you know, trying to navigate not only the federal program, but also, you know, the local city hall or something. It can be difficult to figure out where all those resources are, I know, but I know there are places like the chamber that also have great resources to help help businesses find, you know, lo local help as well. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go off script and ask you before I let you go, one well, I was a little bit confused when you were talking before, and now I'm watching the audience questions come in and mm -hmm. I'm seeing the same question that I had. So I'm just going to ask you to clarify. Yeah. When you were, so for those of us who don't work in government, the American Rescue Plan and the CARES Act, they all start to sound the same and, and yes. I can't remember which are which. So this credit that you can get for either 
your employee to take time off to get vaccinated and recover or for them to take a family member and the family member to recover. Mm -hmm. Is that credit different than the tax credit one could, a business could take that was initiated very early on if the employee was sick with COVID. So is this a different tax right. credit or do they all merge together into a total amount? And the second part of the question from the audience is, if you did do that in 2020, because let's say an employee was sick and yep. now you would like to do it to let them go take a family member to get vaccinated, are they two different tax credits? So, so that's a great question. I, these credits are a continuation of a program that started um, I guess with with uh, FICRA, which was what the even before the CARES Act, um, and so you're right that that is the same tax credit. It's a paid leave tax credit. But as of April 2021, April 1st, 2021, the credit reset. So even if you took and you gave your employees paid leave last year and used up all of the the paid leave that they were entitled to, as of April 1st, 2021 through September 30th, 2021, it's a whole new kind of uh, counting. So you have that $5,000 per employee available for them or up to $12,000 per employee available if they're taking time off for family members. Does that, does that make sense, Jeanette? Does that it does, and it does, okay. and it also answers the second question. So with that, I am going to say thank you very much for joining us. We really appreciate it. I know you're on vacation, so we especially appreciate that you took time on your vacation. So thank you very much. No, thank you. It was um, great to talk to you. Thank you. Take care. Thanks. Take care, Tom. So audience, I am now going to bring in Neil Bradley, who is the U.S. Chamber's Executive Vice President and Chief Policy Officer and Head of Strategic Advocacy. Hi, Neil. Hi, Jeanette. How are you? I'm good. Your title got longer since the last time I interviewed you. Oh, my goodness. Yes. <laughs> uh, we keep adding words. That's a tiny little font under your name. <laughs> Um, okay, so that was great that Tom was here. So let's just start with what I just talked about with him. And maybe you can just like unpack a little bit more for us and clarify about this expansion of the tax credit. Um, I could give you specific questions or maybe you could just kind of review what he said and simplify the terms for me if you don't mind. I think there are, there are a couple of key takeaways to think about. So uh, at the very beginning of the pandemic, Congress created a tax credit for employers with fewer than 500 employees, both for-profit and non-profit. And it was to uh, help uh, a employer cover their expenses for continuing to pay an employee who was sick because of COVID, who was quarantining because of COVID, who had to go get testing to determine if they had COVID or if they were caring for a family member, either a family member who was in one of the situations I just described or if they had a child, a child who couldn't attend school or uh, their regular childcare arrangement because of COVID. That tax credit still exists today. And what the Biden administration has wisely done is said, in addition to all of those reasons, you've all, always been able to claim the credit. If the employer gives an employee time off so that the employee can take a family member to get vaccinated, or someone in their household to get vaccinated, then you can provide them as the employer paid time off to do that and get reimbursed by through this tax credit by the federal government. And so um, if you're familiar with the credit, it's, it's, it's nothing new. It's the exact same credit that existed before. It's just now you have another opportunity to claim the credit as an employer if you've given an employee time off to help someone in their household get vaccinated. Great. And just to review, this is something where you would pay the employee and then you would claim it as a credit against your payroll taxes. That's right. You, you claim it as a, as a credit against your payroll taxes. Uh, you claim it when you file your quarterly payroll uh, tax report. And so um, you keep track of those expenses and it's done on a quarterly basis. It's also refundable. If for some reason um, this and some of the other tax credits, which I know we're going to talk about in a moment, if it ends up that your tax credit is more than what you owe the government, then the government is going to send you a check back. It's fully refundable. Great. Okay. Thank you. I'm sure we're going to get a lot of questions about this during the Q&A, so we'll come back to it. Um, can we talk about PPP forgiveness? Um, I know the SBA launched a portal 
that would simplify and streamline the forgiveness process for PPP loans of $150,000 or less. But I think it's not that simple. So could you just clarify exactly what that really means? Yeah. So in recent weeks, the SBA has made two really important announcements. And you just mentioned one of them. And I want to make sure we come back to the other one in a moment. That has to do with a, a revenue reduction score. But on the one you mentioned, um, if the SBA for loans under $150,000 has created an expedited portal for you to apply for loan forgiveness. Now there's a catch. The catch is, is that your lender, the person, the lender who originated your loan has to agree to participate in that program for you to be able to take advantage of that, which immediately raises the question, how am I supposed to know whether my lender is participating in the program? Well, if you go to the SBA website right there on PPP and loan forgiveness, I did this about 10 minutes before uh, before joining our conversation today. Um, you have a list of every lender who is currently participating in the program. And as of today, it's up to almost 900 lenders across the country. So you go to the portal, you check uh, to see if your lender is listed. And if your lender is listed, then and your loan is less than one hundred fifty thousand dollars. You can apply through that portal on the SBA website. You no longer have to go to your lender directly. Um, and I will actually make it easier for the audience because after this event, we're going to be sending them an email. And in that email are a couple of co-stories and we have links there at the top of the co-stories to that list of lenders that have opted in. So they, they can go right from there. Um, let's talk about the employee retention tax credit. I think Tom mentioned it, but it's been a while since we reviewed what that actually is and if it's still available. Before we get to that, is there any chance we can go? I would love to explain this uh, revenue reduction score because it's one important oh. piece of PPP. Yes, I'm sorry. So, so we talked about the 150,000 and less expedited. If you got a second draw PPP loan, you may recall that one of the requirements for receiving that loan is that you had to have a 25% reduction in revenue compared to a prior quarter in order to be eligible for the loan. And for loans of 150,000 or less, they uh, required the documentation of that reduction, not when you applied for the loan, but when you applied for forgiveness. For a lot of second draw PPP borrowers, this has created a big paperwork castle. All of a sudden, you're now having to get paperwork together that you didn't have to get together the first time. So the SBA has tried to simplify this through what they call a revenue reduction score. And simply put, it's an automated data kind of driven process where uh, you can provide information about your business and it will generate based on the type of business you're in, the location that you're operating in, a uh, approximate revenue reduction score. And if that revenue reduction score shows that you had more than a 25% reduction or that the government thinks it's reasonable that you would have had more than a 25% reduction, you don't have to do anything else. You don't have to go get all that paperwork and all that documentation. But if it turns out the government says, we're not sure whether you had a revenue reduction of 25%, you can still prove that you did through gathering up those documentation. So uh, think about it as kind of like an easy pass lane. Um, you, you go to the easy pass lane, and if it says you're approved, you don't have to go back and get all of this extra paperwork together. So if you have a second draw PPP loan for less than $150,000, take a look at that COVID reduction score because it might save you just a whole lot of time in the forgiveness process in terms of the documentation you need to complete. So I'm glad you brought us back to this because now it's leading me to other questions. So where would the business owner find this? Is it part of the loan forgiveness process through their lender or the SBA? Or is this a place that they would go like on the SBA website? So it's through the SBA. Uh, and in general, uh, they've they've streamlined it for lenders that are participating in the portal program. So it's kind of a one stop shop type thing for your second draw loans. Um, if it's the case that your lender's not participating in the portal program, uh, the SBA is looking at being able to provide borrowers with a score that they can then work with their lender on. But, you know, with, with close to 900 lenders participating, 
Hopefully your lenders participate in the portal program. And if you have that second draw loan, you'll be able to take advantage of the score to hopefully expedite uh, the loan forgiveness process. Right. So you're going to figure out what that score is as part of the process. You're not going to need to go into the process knowing what the score is. Correct. Yes. Okay, great. Okay. We ready to leave PPP? We are. Yeah, you bet. <laughs> All right. Employee retention tax credit. Um, you know, I was just excited to get there because it's my favorite one. Um, so just please remind everyone what it is. And can you just tell us if it's still something you can apply for? Sure. So let's answer that last part first. It is still something you can apply for. Under current law, the employee retention tax credit exists through the end of calendar year 2021. So through the rest of this year, though legislation pending in Congress right now may get rid of the last quarter of this year, meaning uh, October, November, and December. So it's possible that in the coming weeks, Congress could sunset um, uh, the employee retention tax credit earlier. Okay, so now, now we know when it ends, what is it? The employee retention tax credit is a tax credit for employers with fewer than 500 employees who've seen a 20% drop in revenue in a calendar quarter of 2021 relative to the same quarter in 2019 or the immediately prior quarter in 2021 or in 2020. So think about it this way, compare today to 2019 or this quarter to the prior quarter. And if you've had more than a 20% drop in revenue, then you can claim an employee retention tax credit. The amount of the tax credit is 70% of the first $10,000 in wages in a quarter that you pay each employee. So 70% of 10,000, it's up to $7,000 per employee per quarter. If your small business uh, qualifies for all four quarters, for the employees that you're paying at that time, it can be up to worth up to $28,000 over the course of the entire year. And that's also a credit against your um, taxes? It's, a, it's another credit against your payroll taxes, and it's also fully refundable. So again, this is one that you file each quarter as an employer. Um, if uh, you take, you get to reduce the payroll taxes that you're remitting to the federal government. And if it turns out your tax credit's worth more than what you're going to remit, the government sends you a check. Great. Thank you. Um, federal unemployment benefits, which is, the, which is the additional amount of unemployment a person could collect over and above what they would be collecting from their state. Um, it, do we know when that is set to end? Yeah, the, the $300 weekly supplement expires on September 4th of this year. So um, after September 4th, there's no more additional automatic $300 on top of your regular unemployment benefits. Now, a number of states, in fact, uh, 26 states uh, have, have moved to end that $300 a week supplement early. Now, in some states, the governor's action rescinding that has been blocked by the courts. So I think we're at a 20, about 20 states right now uh, where it's going to end prior to September 4th. But no matter what, unless Congress extends it, and I don't think that's going to happen, the $300 expires for the entire country on September 4th. Yes, that was my next question is, did you have any reason to think it would be extended? Uh, I, I don't believe it's going to be extended. Great. Um, I know or think that the restaurant uh, revitalization fund uh, funds are no more. Um, so that's closed. But the shuttered venue operator grant, where do we stand with that? Is that something uh, businesses can still apply for? Do you know? You're exactly right on the restaurant revitalization that is run out of money and closed. Um, I, you know, I don't I, I don't know on the shuttered operators. Uh, they were having such a trouble time getting the money out the door. I don't know whether they've exhausted their full limit yet. Let, let, let us check on that. We'll circle back to everyone. OK, thanks. Um, let's move on from programs to talk about uh, vaccine mandates. It's a very sticky subject. We know um, just how do you think small businesses and I, I think it's a much harder decision for a small business to make just because they, they're it's a tough time to hire as it is. So you don't want to do anything to put 
you know, the employees you have in, in jeopardy in terms of losing them. But how do you think small businesses should be thinking about whether to mandate vaccines or not? Well, you're right. It, it is a difficult, um, a difficult decision to make. There are clearly uh, benefits in terms of combating COVID uh, and ensuring, you know, a safe workplace for all your employees uh, who are who are back in physical contact with one another, um, who are ongoing physical contact if they have uh, the vaccine. Um, I think a few things that as we're talking to businesses that they're considering first is trying to get a sense of where their employees are. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, uh, knowing how many of your employees have been vaccinated. And by the way, you could do that anonymously. If you're a medium sized business, large, small business, if you're a family operation or with just a couple employees, you probably have already have a pretty good sense of whether your employees are vaccinated or not. So knowing, uh, where you stand on that kind of can give you some sense of, um, are you likely to, to, to get to a, an appropriate threshold? If you do mandate it, are you likely to have lots of resistance if you mandate it? It kind of helps you understand that. I think also understanding if there are uh, employees who uh, have not been vaccinated, having a better sense of why. Um, are they waiting for the FDA to, to grant full approval? Uh, is that an important signal for them? And by the way, with the Pfizer vaccine, we expect FDA full approval um, probably within the next month uh, at, at this point. Um, or are they immune compromised themselves and therefore it's difficult for them to get vaccinated? Having some sense of those issues, I think can help employers make a more informed decision about what's um, likely to be received well by their employee base, but also help achieve the goal, which is a safe and uh, a safe and healthy workplace. Okay. We, for businesses that are not choosing to mandate, we have seen some creativity around how they're encouraging employees to get vaccinated or rewarding or incentivizing. Do you want to just address that a little bit on the kinds of things we're hearing from businesses? Yeah, you know, since since the vaccine became available, we've seen employers provide paid time off uh, for people to get vaccinated. And now, as we discussed with Tom at the top of the conversation, uh, the federal government is helping reimburse small businesses to uh, provide time off for them to take their family members uh, and household members to get vaccinated. Um, we've seen uh, employers provide uh, cash incentives, $150, $200 for employees who get vaccinated. Some employers are providing additional days off. So, you know, if an employee regularly would receive two weeks of paid vacation, they get an extra three days of paid vacation if they go and they get vaccinated. All the way down to kind of gift cards and uh, incentive programs where if a business hits a certain level of vaccinations, uh, there's a reward for the for the entire employee base. And so uh, I think there's lots of creative things going on here, uh, largely because we know that getting more people vaccinated is the way to defeat the Delta uh, variant and ensure that we can fully reopen uh, all operations as close to normal uh, as humanly possible. Yeah. Neil, we're about to do something we have never done in a small business update. Are you ready? Let's do it. Okay. So first of all, audience, <laughs> um, audience, I am going to come to your questions next. So keep entering them because uh, Neil is ready for those. But Neil, we are about to talk about something that has nothing to do with COVID. Are you ready? Oh my goodness. Okay. It's been a year and a half of nothing but. Right. So here we go. We are seeing a huge startup boom. I don't know if it's I think that during the pandemic, people really had time to think about what they wanted to do and got excited about becoming entrepreneurs and starting businesses. We're seeing a huge startup boom in all different sectors. So um, I guess I just wanted to ask you, you know, do you have any feelings about why that's happening? And just maybe just a little bit on what kinds of programs are out there for people who are just starting businesses at Co. I get emails every single day asking, I'm starting a business. What kinds of funding is available for me from the government? So maybe you could just talk about that a little. Yeah. So it, it, I wish I knew exactly why this was happening. Uh, I, I don't, but I know it's really, really good news. I don't know if it's people um, who just uh, saw the pandemic and said, life's too short, I'm going to follow my dream and start a business, or uh, someone in the midst of the pandemic had a 
great idea for, for a business pop into their head and they decided to, to take a leap and, and start their business. But you're exactly right. We're hitting new kind of modern day records uh, in terms of new business starts. And, you know, there's I've seen some critics out there who say, well, it's people trying to figure out just how to how to get by. No, if you if you delve down into the data, these are people who are starting businesses that are the most likely to become employers themselves, meaning it's not somebody just hanging out a shingle and and saying and being self-employed. Uh, these are people who are creating businesses that have business plans to grow and to become employers in and of themselves. Um, in terms of assistance, some of the programs that we've talked about uh, here today um, are available for new business starts, some of the tax credits, et cetera. Um, there are different rules around that, but if you started your business in the last six months or in the last year, you could likely still qualify for many of those tax credits, but those are still COVID specific. Uh, the best resources for uh, new business starts kind of disregarding COVID are really at the SBA where they have uh, great guides on uh, the resources that are available. Uh, that includes some small business loans from the government. There are very few startup grants, but there are small business loans that the federal government provides. Uh, but there's also uh, technical assistance, as I know Co also uh, provides a ton of assistance about uh, obtaining financing from a local or community bank or self-financing the start of a business um, or attracting investors and how you go about uh, uh, attracting private investors into your small business and how you structure that. So uh, there are some loans available, very few grants, but lots of resources that I know Co and, and others have to help people navigate uh, venues and ways of financing your new business. Yep. And thank you for the plug for Co. Okay. We are going to go to the audience Q and A. We have a lot of questions, Neil. So I'm just going to jump right in. Um, this person says, "Do we need to ask our bank to fill out the SBA forgiveness application, or do we do that by ourselves and leave the bank out?" So I'll let you answer. Well, I assume this is a borrower under $150,000 who wants to take advantage of the portal. If your lender is already registered uh, into the portal system, and that's on that. Uh, uh, spreadsheet on the SBA website that Jeanette's going to send out uh, to all the attendees after after this event, then no, you go straight into the portal. Um, if your lender is not registered uh, to use the portal, doesn't appear on that list, or your loan is, wor is for more than $150,000, you still have to go to your original lender. Okay. Um, I see a couple of people asking this question, which is interesting. I didn't even think of this. For the vaccine tax credit, whether it's for your employee themselves or for their family member. If they've taken PTO to go do that, which technically means you haven't paid their salary, but I guess you have in that you've, they've used their PTO. So do you think the employer can claim the tax credit if PTO was used for those well, absences? So um, going all the way back to, um, early 2021 where this was created. Um, this is a, a supplement in addition to any paid time off that an employer already provides. So the way to think of it is this way. If you, if you an employer, let's say you provide seven days of paid sick leave and an employee took paid sick leave to go get vaccinated, you, the employer, can't both count that as paid sick leave and get reimbursed by the federal government for the cost of that. What you could do instead is say, that wasn't paid sick leave, that was actually paid time off that we're providing, we're gonna get reimbursed by the federal government and the employee still has their full amount of, of paid sick leave. Right, you could just re refund their sick leave as it were, right. yeah, right. okay. Um, this person says, what kind of documentation do we need to submit for the tax credit? And I don't know which tax credit, but I assume really for any of the tax credits, maybe you could answer that question. Yeah, so there are, there are forms on their IRS website. Um, it's not a great deal of documentation, uh, particularly with respect to the paid time off um, uh, uh, tax credit for the employee retention tax credit in addition to the wages that you're paying, you have to document that you've had that reduction 
in revenue that qualifies you for the credit. So a little bit more documentation with respect to the employee retention tax credit, a little bit less with respect to uh, the paid leave credit. But again, those forms currently available on the IRS website. I'm getting a lot of questions about EIDL, and I didn't ask you about that. Um, so maybe you could just review for everyone what EIDL stands for. And this questions I'm getting specifically are, can you still get one? And if you apply for forgiveness of the EIDL loan, they're asking for a modification of the loan. So. Do you know what the status of that is? Sure. So EIDL stands for Economic Injury Disaster Loans. Um, this is a longstanding program administered by the, by the SBA. It predates COVID. So think of it this way. When there's a, a natural disaster, um, you know, a flood, a fire, a hurricane, uh, this is the loan program that is available through the SBA. And Congress expanded it uh, to include COVID related uh, injuries to small businesses as part of these, these COVID packages. You still can go to the SBA website and apply for an EIDL loan. It is a loan. Uh, it's pretty favorable terms. It's 30 years, uh, three and three quarters percent interest at a fixed rate. Uh, the current maximum loan is $500,000. Uh, and so that is available. Because it's a loan, it's it's not forgivable. So this isn't like PPP where you can have the loan forgiven. This is truly a loan. The borrower has to pay it back. Okay. While we were talking, this person looked at the list of participating lenders and discovered that theirs, their lender is not participating in the SBA, SBA streamlined forgiveness process. So their question was, what do they do? So they so do they wait for them to join or do they go, they need to for, apply for forgiveness through their lender, right? Well, they would need to apply for forgiveness. I'll tell you what I would do personally. Um, I would reach out to that lender and say, do you intend to participate in this program? Because if you do, it's streamlined for, for me and for all the other borrowers who, who got PPP uh, and, and I'd like to use that. And you know, if they tell you no, that they're, they're not gonna participate or or uh, if they tell you they don't know, then you know at some point you'll have to make a decision not to keep waiting and, and to go through your lender to get your PPP loan forgiveness. Okay. I have uh, just general questions from folks who have applied for the employee retention tax credit and just haven't heard anything. Just do you have any general sense of whether they're running really behind or if it's been three months and you haven't heard, maybe you need to... I don't know. Have you heard that they're running very far behind? Yeah, they are running behind. They're, they are running very, I mean, the, the IRS has been kind of overloaded with this. Um, uh, I have not heard of a significant number of people having their their claim of tax credits denied. Um, you obviously want to make sure you have all the documentation that's required and thought the, the paperwork the right way. Uh, but, but, you know, like uh, tax return processing and everything else, the IRS has been overwhelmed and, and uh, as my understanding, they are way behind. Um, this person asked a question that I don't fully understand, but it leads me to a question. So they said, and I'm telling you it because maybe you'll understand it. When will the smaller loans for sole proprietors be available for loan forgiveness? But this also leads me into, I seem to recall that there was a PPP loan amount at which you would it would automatically be forgiven. Am I misremembering that? Um, you, what you're remembering is is that there's a, a presumption of forgiveness. So um, you still have to you still have to complete paperwork. Um, you either have to go through the portal or through your lender. Uh, but it's a streamlined process for loans of I believe it's less than one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And so what they've really tried to do is simplify that process. Uh, for uh, small dollar borrowers and including the self-employed. Uh, but it's not, um, when I hear people say automatic, it, it sounds like, well, I don't have to do anything. No, 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 no. You, you, you still have to apply for the forgiveness. It's just that all the reams of paperwork and the, the really long forms have been condensed down into essentially a, an easy page uh, that, that's much easier for a borrower to fill out. 
Yeah, I'm glad you clarified that because I do feel like that is exactly what I was implying. So I want to be very clear that that is not the case. No matter what size your loan is, Neil, you have to apply. Right, right. right. They're not, they have not given blanket forgiveness, right? So, um, you know, you still want to make sure that you follow through uh, on the document side on your end. And, it, and it's going to be easier if you're, if you're, if you have a $50,000 loan, it should be a pretty quick process. Good. Okay. So thank you for clarifying that. I'm, we have the most popular question apparently is whether you think there will be more, um, any more draws for PPP loans or for additional idle loans. So just, just to clarify, if you never took an idle loan before now, you could still apply for one now, right? Correct. I, I, w I went on earlier to, to check and make sure they hadn't changed it. And there's an apply now button. Right. So, and what about PPP? Do you have any reason to think? No, I, I think we're, I think we're done with the, the, the PPP program. So okay. uh, I do not, uh, uh, yeah. A absent circumstances that none of us want to even envision or think about, um, uh, meaning a significant economic downturn, you know, further outbreak shuts down. You know, Congress is not going to continue uh, the PPP program. Um, is, this person says, in the past, you have said that PPP dollars paid to employees during any quarter are not eligible for the ERTC, or as we like to call it, no double dipping. Is that true still? That is true still. So you can, it used to be that you had to, and Tom mentioned this, that you had to choose between either the PPP program or the employee retention tax credit. Now you don't have to choose. You can take advantage of both. You just can't take advantage of both for the exact same paycheck. Um, so you can't, you know, double dip. That's exactly right. Okay. Um, this is a question that I have seen a lot, which is, how does HIPAA affect employers asking about vaccine status? Yeah, uh, you know, this is one where I, I would steer you to your HR professionals and to um, your, your your legal counsel on this because you don't want to do it uh, incorrectly. Uh, but this is really about, HIPAA is really designed about the public disclosure of information. So you do have some requirements here, uh, but um, the EOC, uh, in particular, and other government agencies have said that employers can, uh, you know, do things like temperature checks and vaccination status and inquire of those in those areas without running afoul. So um, I, I don't want to get into all the details how you do that because I, I want to make sure people do it right. Uh, but but you should contact you know your your HR folks, uh, a, a lawyer uh, to make sure that you navigate that the right way. Sure. Um, I'm going to take us away from COVID for a second uh, to an issue that's also facing small businesses around hiring. And we know that there's a real challenge for a lot of businesses in, in hiring help. I know seasonal businesses here at the Jersey Shore cannot find employees. Restaurants can't find employees. Just what is the chamber thinking about in terms of this hiring challenge? And, and just where do you think this is heading? Yeah. Um I, we don't use the word crisis um, lightly, but this is a worker shortage crisis. You know, we got new numbers out of the Department of Labor this morning. We had a record 10.1 million open jobs in this country. Uh, if you took every person who is currently unemployed, plus every person who is marginally attached to the workforce, you, every one of those people could get a job and we would still have job openings. And of course, we know that people aren't where necessarily where the jobs are open. Uh, they may not have the skills for some of the jobs that are open. They may not want to take some of the jobs uh, that, that are open. But that's how great this mismatch is. We've never had this big of a disparity between the jobs open and the lack of people uh, available to fill them. At the Chamber, we've launched a, an America Works initiative all designed around kind of removing barriers to filling these open jobs. And that's everything from childcare and daycare assistance so that working parents can get back into the workforce 
more easily to rapid skills training uh, to frankly immigration. You mentioned Jeanette, the, the Jersey Shore, you know, in a lot of uh, seasonal communities around the country uh, rely on uh, what are called J visas, people who come into the country, come, excuse me, come into the country legally on a temporary basis and spend part of their time working at at the beach or at a ski resort um, and then go back to their to their home country. We're not admitting uh, virtually anyone under J visas right now. And that means that we're further exacerbating that that workforce uh, shortage. So um, there's no single cause of this, but there are a lot of things that we can do to begin help addressing it. And at the chamber, we're trying to focus policymakers on what are those things that we can begin doing? And at the same time, trying to help employers figure out what you can do. Um, this is a great opportunity to think about second chance hiring. Uh, so the hiring of the formerly incarcerated, there are great best practices that are out there to help employers figure out how to tap for many of them, what is a kind of new uh, category of potential workers. Great, thank you. Um, this, I've got a few different questions about tax exempt organizations. So um, maybe we could just do like a lightning round of what tax exempt organizations can apply for and what they can't. So can they apply for the employee retention tax credit? Uh, generally, yes. And can they apply for the um, tax credit for getting employees or employee families vaccinated? Yes. Okay. Um, more generally, this question speaks to what kinds of expenses are forgivable. So it says, is the cost of hiring a company to regularly clean your office to prevent COVID-19 a forgivable expense under covered worker protection expenditures to comply with guidance issued by our local health department on the PPP loan? So uh, it was done in compliance with local health directives. Um, COVID, uh, I mean, based on the information that they just provided, I, I would think it's quite likely um, that if it's over and above like your normal cleaning expenses, so it's, you know, additional measures to comply with public health guidance, uh, that, that that might very well be a, an eligible expense. Um, remember, it's still limited along with all your other non-payroll expenses. Your non-payroll expenses can't exceed 40% uh, of your total amount of forgivable expenses. Uh, but there, there are categories like that there are kind of COVID specific health measures. This person says, when I applied for my second draw PPP loan, I provided documentation of a 25% reduction. Does that automatically give me forgiveness? Well, again, I, 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 I stress over the word automatically because I want to make sure that people uh, don't assume you don't have to do anything else. But if you've already gathered up the documentation uh, of the 25%, you've provided that, that will just be part of your loan forgiveness um, uh, application. You don't, you don't have to do anything else because you've already done that with respect to that portion. Now, remember, there are other still requirements, right? What did you use the the PPP loan proceeds for, right? Um, you, you still have to document those things for your forgiveness, but you've clearly already pulled together all the information and submitted on the documentation of the 25% reduction. Okay. I try never to ask you questions that I don't understand because it's a risky move, but this one seems important. So I'm gonna try and hopefully you understand. It says regarding vaccine paid leave to support family members. Is the credit two thirds of pay or does it count against the 80 hours at 100% pay? Ah, yes. Okay. So um, <laughs> they're, they're referring to two different, there, there are two uh, different categories of leave under the tax credit. One is what we would think of as kind of hourly pay, um, up to 80 hours. Um, so essentially two weeks worth. Um, and then there is extended, uh, which is up to, I believe, 10 weeks. To, it's either 10 or 12 weeks where you're caring for a family member at home. Uh, and that is at two thirds your rate of pay. 
So let's leave that aside for a second because the vaccine policy that we're talking about is uh, counts, like if you give someone, let's say four hours off, that counts towards the 80 hours and you're reimbursed dollar for dollar up to $511 per day or per eight hour work period. And so there is a cap on it um, and it, it works out to $511 uh, uh, per day or $5,100 over two weeks. Okay, we are close to being out of time. So I'm gonna just ask you a couple more. Has the expiration of the FFCRA tax credit changed or is it still September 30th, 2021? So just so everyone knows what we're talking about, FFCRA stands for Families First Coronavirus Relief Act. It was the first bill before the CARES Act where this tax credit that we've been talking about all day uh, for uh, sick leave, for time off to get vaccinated, to take your family members to get vaccinated, that's what we're talking about. It originated in the FFCRA. It expires September 30th of 2021. And so uh, this, this tax credit, you can, you can, you know, if you, if you, if you're an employer and you want to offer it for your employees to take a family member uh, to get vaccinated, you can do that between now and September 30th of this year. But under current law, it's not available after September 30th. So if you're thinking, I'll provide this benefit to my employees in October or November, uh, the, the, the benefit will have expired by then. Okay. A um, couple more real quick. Does the vaccine tax credit apply only to W-2 employees or can it be used for 1099 contractors? No, it's, it's your W-2 employees. It's people you're providing, you're paying payroll to. Okay. I'm going to make this your last question. And I am asking it of you because I can't believe that someone's in this situation. And I wonder if you've heard of this. So this person says, so apparently their loan was for more than $150,000. So they're saying, is there any possible extension of the SBA portal for larger loans? Because their lender has not created a mechanism for getting the loan forgiven yet and their deadline to apply is August 25th of this year. And so they literally have no way to apply for loan forgiveness. Oh my goodness. Okay. So one, don't count on the SBA expanding the 150,000. Um, you know, two, get with your lender. The, the, the mechanisms are really SBA forms that you're filling out and simply submitting through your lender. Um, uh, and so it shouldn't, they shouldn't be having to create a lot here. Um, three, if you talk to your lender and, and they're just saying, ah, we don't have it. And you're approaching, you know, your deadline on, on August 25th, um, then I'd be reaching out to the SBA, um, uh, probably through, you know, wherever you're located, the regional office, uh, just look up, you know, SBA regional office for, for your area and see if you can talk to someone about how to navigate this. Because what you don't want to do is obviously um, uh, uh, miss uh, your window for applying for forgiveness and then somehow um, uh, end up in a situation in which um, uh, you're, you're paying interest that you wouldn't otherwise pay um, or, or frankly, a principal that you wouldn't otherwise pay. Great. Okay, we're going to leave it there, Neil. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, we all really appreciate it. Thanks, Jeanette. It was great to be with you again. You too. Thanks. And thanks, of course, to Tom, who also joined us earlier. Uh, for more insights from Neil and other experts, you can check out the resources at the bottom of this page and on Co. And as we mentioned, you'll be getting uh, some articles in your email as well. To our audience, I thank you so much for joining us today. We're glad you're with us and we will see you soon. Take care, everyone. Thank you.